Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. And of course, we welcome those who are joining us on our heritage.org website on this occasion. For those in-house, we would ask you to do that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. So far, mine has never gone off during that. We shall see. And for those watching online, you're reminded you can send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Leading our discussion this afternoon is Lindsay Burke, who is the Will Skillman Fellow in Education Policy. She is also Director of Heritage's Center for Education Policy. She, of course, writes on federal and state education issues and looks at the reducing the federal role in education and empowering families with school choice. She is also unique in one, of the, one case in that she has taught school, so she actually has first class experience. And she has spoken on education reform issues across the country as well as internationally. Please join me in welcoming Lindsay Burke. Lindsay. Thank you, John. Well, thanks everyone for being here. We're really delighted about our program uh, this afternoon. So I first read, and if you don't have a copy, grab one outside, but I first read The Beautiful Tree when I came to Heritage about nine years ago, nearly a decade ago. It was foundational in my thinking about private education and school choice. And to me, is really the perfect companion to Milton and Rose Friedman's Free to Choose. In preparation for this, this conversation, I went back and I reread The Beautiful Tree. And I think amidst, amidst uh, school choice conversations across the country today, both in the states and at the federal level, I found the stories even more resonant than I had the first time around. But from India to Somalia, Nigeria to China, from Kenya to Zimbabwe and Ghana, Dr. Tuli has scoured the earth, uncovering a hidden, denied and denounced private school sector education, ed educating the, wor the world's poorest children adequately, affordably, and with love for the families who patronize these schools. As Dr. Tuli describes, in public schools in India, for example, children get free uniforms, free rice at lunchtime, and free books. The low-cost private schools, by contrast, were crowded, many were dirty, often smelly, usually dark, and on almost every level, makeshift. One was even converted into an inner-city chicken farm, a private school. And yet, the poorest of the poor families were paying the literally couple of dollars that they earned per month to send their, their children to these private schools, a phenomenon that Dr. Tooley says was the central mystery guiding his research. Dr. Tooley's work, which puts a face to that philosophical framework that the Freedmans elucidated, has critical insights for the current school choice movement. Three in particular stood out to me. He writes, the evidence from around the world shows us first that most people, poor as well as rich, care deeply about their children's education and that the middle class has no monopoly on this. The more middle class parents use private education, number two, the more chances there will be of effective chains of private schools emerging. And the more these brand names emerge, the greater the chance of a larger number of people being able to benefit and competing as compete Competing chains lower fees, making their schools accessible to still a larger number of families. And third, when more parents begin using private education, the politicians and opinion makers are more likely to face up to the idiocy of parents paying twice for their children's education, once through taxes and again through private school fees. So these are insights the private school choice movement, I think, can really take to heart. I translate them as parents know best, universality matters, and funds should follow the child. For choice in private education, as Dr. Tooley writes, there's only a virtuous cycle waiting to be conscribed. So a little bit more about our guests, and then we're just gonna have a free-flowing conversation. I've got a few questions, hopefully hear about his research, and then open it up to each of you for questions as well. Dr. James Tooley is professor of education policy at Newcastle University where he directs the E.G. West Center and is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His book, as I mentioned, The Beautiful Tree, A Personal Journey into How the World's Poorest Are Educating Themselves, 
has been featured in several Indian nonfiction bestseller lists, and his research on low-cost private schools has received numerous awards, including the Gold Prize at the Financial Times International Finance Corporation Competition on Private Sector Research, the Templeton Prize for Free Market Solutions to Poverty, and the Alexis de Tocqueville Award for the Advancement of Education Freedom. Dr. Tooley was also founding president of the Education Fund at Orient Global, and spent two years in Hyderabad, India, and plenty since then, I imagine, as well, to uh, create a chain, to help create a chain of low-cost private schools and associated educational infrastructure. He is co-founder and chairman of Omega Schools, a chain of low-cost private schools in Ghana. And in the first few years since it opened, back in 09, they had grown from 40 schools, uh, to, from just a few schools, to 40, with 20,000 students now enrolled. Notably, Dr. Tooley has been described, and this is really the most important facet of his work, as, quote, a 21st century Indiana Jones. It's pretty good. Traveling to, quote, the remotest regions of Earth, researching something that many regard as mythical, private, parent-funded schools serving the third world poor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dame, Dr. James Tooley. As I said, we'll have just a conversation with Dr. Tooley, uh, open it up to questions with each of you after, but I have a few to, to kick us off and would love to just hear generally about your experiences with your research, how you came to, to write this book and what you found. But perhaps we could start off. So you started working in education uh, back in the 80s. You were a math teacher in Zimbabwe. Can you tell us a little about those early experiences, how formative they were to you, and how that ultimately led you to where uh, this book ended up? Yeah, so I guess like you, I've also been a teacher in, yeah. in, in high school. So I was a mathematics teacher as a young man. As a young man, I was a, a young socialist. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I think it was Winston Churchill who said, the, the young man who's not a socialist when he's 18 has no heart. I had plenty of heart when I was a young man. Um, he went on to say, I think, that the man who is not a conservative by the time he's 40 has no brain. <laughs> and uh, perhaps I've managed to find my brain since. But I, I, I was a young socialist. Zimbabwe was newly independent, and I went out there to help build the Marxist-Leninist regime that Mugabe was promising us. And uh, it, it was formative in many ways, but not vis-a-vis -vis the role of the state in education. I was teaching in um, state schools. I saw in different standards but I didn't really start thinking about the role of government in education until I came back from Zimbabwe. Um, I came back from Zimbabwe to, this was late 1980s in, in, in the UK. Margaret Thatcher was mm -hmm. prime minister and she was bringing in market reforms in education, and, uh, or so-called market reforms. And I, I started my doctoral thesis at the left-wing Institute of Education, UCL Institute of Education in London. I signed on with a left-wing professor, and I was going to write the definitive thesis uh, slamming everything about uh, Margaret Thatcher's education reforms. And it was actually I read Professor E.G. West's work, Education and the State, and that led me... I mean, I thought this must be wrong. You know, he was talking about how really education doesn't need the state to, to be involved in any way large way. I thought that must be wrong. I wanted to argue against it. And in the end, my thesis came out as a defense of E.G. West and not an attack on Margaret Thatcher. And so then I became a, I was then an expert on private education. I was in favor of private education. I started to get all these consultancies from the International Finance Corporation, um, based here in Washington, DC, obviously. Um, they, they used to send us consultants and the World Bank used to send consultants to India um, on Concord, we used to get the, uh, the, was it the American Eagle from DC to John J.F. Kennedy uh, Airport, and then we used to fly Concord to London. And anyway, these, these, were the, these are days have gone past, these days have gone past. But anyway, and that's when I was on a consultancy for the IFC in Hyderabad in India, when I, um, I, I was frustrated, you know, here I was, for whatever reason, I felt my life should be geared towards helping the poor. Um, and yet, I was an expert on private education. Everyone knows private education is for the rich. You know. uh, so how was I to come somehow get around that confusion in my life? And I went into the slums of the old city of Hyderabad. And that's where I found 
low-cost private schools. My first low-cost private school I found, which in those days charged a dollar or so a month. And that was really, you know, that was, the, that was my epiphany moment. It really was an epiphany moment. I discovered these schools. For, I discovered them for myself, that was. They were there already. And uh, my life changed. It's yeah. amazing. And so you, in the book, you detail, uh, I think, in a really vivid way, how you did actually come to find these schools, that you are, you know, when you're uh, talking to folks on the street, having to convince them that, no, not, not these government schools over here, but I promise you there are private schools. So can you talk a little bit about how you did that, working with the folks on the yes. ground to kind of make that actual yeah. journey? And, and this, this is something that has changed yeah. since, since the book. I mean, the book and it wasn't just the book, but we have had an influence now, and there isn't this blanket denial of these schools. But when I started the work uh, some 17, 15 years ago, um, th there was this blanket denial. I used to come back from my you know, uh, sorties into the slums in Africa and South Asia or wherever, and I used to come back to places like the World Bank here in Washington and say, Look, there's something amazing going on. You know, <laughs> the poor are using private schools. They're there on every street corner. You go down one street and you see five or six. And what was the response? Calm down, Tuli. You know, you're, you're, you've maybe seen a few businessmen ripping off the poor. You know, you, you've, uh, you've not found anything exciting. But even in the places, you know, and even with people who should know better, you know, perhaps some of colleagues in mark, free market think tanks around the world, I would go there and say, look, I want to see the low-cost private schools in the slums. And they would say, in our country, private schools are for the rich. And I'd say, OK, fine. Um, can I get a taxi then anyway? And I'd go and get a taxi to some of these poor areas. And uh, it, it doesn't take long to find them. you know. And anyone who goes on a visit to any of those countries in Africa or, or South Asia, just you know, go, to, go to some poor areas, and you will find low-cost private schools. You'll see them as you drive through these areas, and you can, you can be part of that, that process of seeing these schools for yourself. Yeah. Can you describe the, the conditions in which these schools exist? I, I remember reading in your book, you know, you're walking over, uh, I forget where you were, maybe Ghana, but walking across a log, trying not to slip into the black water underneath. Yeah. And, I mean, the conditions are pretty, they're yeah. pretty rough. And, and, and obviously, so, so India has developed quite a lot since I wrote the book. And so some of the slums that I was working in then are now sort of lower middle class areas. Um, but there are still slums in India too. I, I mean, the, the one you described, the, 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 the one with the black waters, mm -hmm. as I described it in the book, is Makoko mm -hmm. in, uh, in Lagos. And that's when you, you drive from the airport, if you're driving like a normal person, you go on third mainland bridge to Victoria Island, which is where the, the posh hotels are. And um, you, you'll see down there, you know, Makoko, which is this shanty town built on stilts into these, you know, the dark waters of the Lagos Lagoon. And the dark waters are there in part because they're Makoko's latrine, you know, um, maybe a quarter of a million people's latrine there. And you, the first time I traveled over there, going across, I asked my, um, the people who were going to help me with the research, I said, that's where I want to go, you know, for, that's, that's where I want to go for, to do my research. And they said, no, it's too dangerous, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so the next day I went on my own uh, without them and took a taxi. And then the taxi then wanted to stop at the edge of the shantytown saying it was too dangerous. So I went in by canoe, you know, and we went in around on the canoe there. And it, it is an amazing experience. You're going there in places which are, like, like, you know, if, if you've been to Africa, you know these sort of places, but they're like nothing you can imagine when you're back here in D.C. or wherever. And, uh, and, and you know, so they're literally, Makoko is literally houses built on stilts, wooden houses built on stilts, um, big families in one room and so on. And anyway, we find kids, and we found kids there running around and said, where do you go to school? And this little girl, Sandra, was the first person we met, and she said, KPS. And uh, what does that stand for? Kennedy, hmm, promising. Kennedy what? Kennedy Private School. And it was one of 32 private schools we found in that, in that, uh, that, that shanty town. And um, yeah, so it, it is, it's a remarkable experience going to places like that. But linking in with your original comments, it's remarkable how, I, I mean, I, I feel I've learned everything I know, really, about this 
area from talking to parents, students, or educational entrepreneurs in those sort of places. You know, they, they will t talk about educational freedom. They will talk about choice. They will talk about the in inadequacies of the government schools and the virtues of the free market in education. They have told me everything I know. In a sense, I'm just relaying what they tell me, you know. Yeah. So, but it uh, wasn't actually like John F. Kennedy private school, right? It was no, it was Ken A. D., which is a Nigerian name. Right, it's A. E. N. A. D. E. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it could have been. I, I, I have a nice photograph of uh, not not Kennedy, but the um, uh, goodness me, my I've got my jet lag is coming in. Uh, Reagan, Reagan, um, <laughs> Ronald Reagan private school in the slums of Monrovia, mm -hmm. um, in Liberia. So you know these. The names do yeah. get there. I, incidentally, when we drove past or we walked past there with my, my driver, and I, I said, I need a photograph of that for, for American audience. And he <laughs> said, uh, so who, who is this Ronald Reagan? You know, uh, Amazing. Yeah. So why do you think? So there's this thriving, hidden private school sector, uh, hidden to researchers. But reading the book, I, I don't think that they're actually hidden to government officials, right? They're, yeah. they're just dismissed in a way. Yeah, there's a bit of both going on. Yeah. There's a bit of both going on. And I, I think some, some officials just really didn't know about yeah. these schools. Yeah. Um, government officials tended not to go in these really poor slums. They're, you know, they're not necessarily pleasant places to visit, you know, the smell, the dirt, the filth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so sometimes they really genuinely didn't know. And yeah. And sometimes they they knew and were were very threatened by these schools. Yeah. That's that's something that is very clear in all the work. How government is very th government and the teacher unions, um, they're they're very and and the NGOs and the international development agencies. All these were very threatened by this. And in a way, it's quite obvious why they're threatening because it goes against what you know sixty five years of development. Um, uh, advocacy, doesn't it? That only government schools, public schools, can serve the poor, and you need huge dollops of international aid to get it right. And here are you know, little poor people saying, actually, we don't want your government schools, we don't want your public schools, we don't want the public schools that are funded in part by international aid. We'd much rather have these little schools that are um, serving us better and that are accountable to us. Yeah. Um, so. But yes, yeah, so, so some government officials knew about them. In many cases, government officials try to close these schools. So we've got a fight on at the moment um, in Rivers State in, in uh, Nigeria. Um, Port Harcourt, there's the sort of the oil rich area. And the governor of Rivers State is trying to close nearly 2,000 low cost private schools. And you know, the, so it, it's a bit like what do you call it, the, the American whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole, no, whack whack whack-a-mole. Yeah, it's a bit like that. You know, so we we've, we've whacked the mole in Lagos State. We've got them to now accept the existence of these private schools. Probably fourteen thousand private, low-cost private schools in Lagos State alone. We've got them to accept it, and just about you know accept their you know playing a huge role in development. And now you know. The, the, the problem appears in River State. They're trying to close these schools, and so we've got to go there and try and convince them that, look, they're doing a great job. And, and anyway, where are you going to put um, 300,000 kids? Have you got room in your s schools for 300,000 kids? Where are you going to put? If it's 2,000 schools, 10 teachers in each, what, what are you going to tell those 20, 25,000 people who are made unemployed? Um, but still, governments are doing this. And in India, India, we've got a huge problem at the moment. Um, there's a new, a relatively new education act called the Right to Education Act. Who can be against that? Well, um, it, it, the problem is many in government see this as a way of closing the low-cost private schools. And in Punjab, for instance, I think a couple of thousand of these private schools have been closed. Um, in Andhra Pradesh, a similar number, Haryana. And uh, I spoke to one official in Punjab, a government official, and he said, uh, the trouble with you foreigners, you... 2,000 like, sounds like a big number. 200,000 kids sounds like a large number of kids, but we're a big country, you know. We've got many kids here. And somehow this was acceptable to throw 200,000 kids out of the schools their parents have chosen in preference to the government schools, which they say are inadequate and which clearly are inadequate, where the teachers don't turn up. If they do, they don't teach, or they get children running errands for them. So uh, yeah, the struggle continues. Yeah. yeah. So the the right to education law that you mentioned in India, mm. 
in reading the book, I was thinking about compulsory education laws yes. in general. Do they exist in mm. the in Zimbabwe and Ghana and India? Mm. And if not, what effect do you think the addition of compulsory ed would have on the low-cost private school sector? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, N Neil would probably be able to answer this better th th than me. But my understanding of in in developed countries, I hate these terms, but in Western yeah. countries, um, compulsory education laws generally followed when you had the vast majority of kids in school. I think that was certainly true of England and Wales. I think it was true of Massachusetts and New York states and so on. So typically, governments do compulsory laws when when people are in school already. So, do, do you know, I, it's not even a question. I mean, I must have asked it sometimes, but it's not really a re very relevant question because um, most parents want their kids to be in school. You know, this is the, the one of your summary remarks here. You know, most parents, I mean, almost universally across this planet, whenever I've been in poor areas, you don't find many parents who don't want schooling for their kids. Some can't afford it. Very, you know, a, a small percentage, but um, most want that for their kids. So the compulsory laws are irrelevant. If if it's compulsory and you can't afford it, then you don't send your kids <laughs> anyway, you know, right, right, right. but you want to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems that there's a line from compulsory to government provision to the crowd out of the private market. To, yeah. um, so on the, the affordability piece, I was just struck by the, the business model, for lack of a better term, but these are schools where tuition is $2 a month, yeah. $4 so the, a so month. So inflation has gone up now. So sure. t typically think of the schools now perhaps 5 to 15 US dollars equivalent per, per month. month. Yeah. So, the t yeah. I mean, tuition is, is low, and then you remark that you... For many kids, even that is out of reach. I mean, these are families. I'd love for you to talk about the, the backgrounds of the families, but these are families, some of whom are bringing in $15 a month. Yeah. And so uh, you said that it's in some cases the poor subsidizing the poor. Uh, so it's just it's, it's such an interesting model and one with which yeah. we're unfamiliar. So, so, so we, we've done a lot of work on, on affordability yeah. since The Beautiful Tree. So this is where the, the argument now is, I hope, more sophisticated than in that book. Um, but... So, so first of all, th think of poverty lines. Poverty lines that are typically now one dollar twenty-five, but it's per person per day. Mm -hmm. So a family will have generally more than one of those incomes. So it's misleading to think of it as being just that amount coming in. And then that's at purchasing power parity, right. two thousand and five exchange rates, or whatever. So it's actually typically more, you know. A family on the poverty line typically gets more than we imagine, given that 125. Yeah. You know, so so the first of all, it's not quite straightforward just to say that poverty sure. line, you know, translates to these fees. But um, no, we we worked out a, a, a formula where we said if a family, a typical size family, is on the poverty line, and they're not going to spend more than 10 percent of their total income on school fees for all of their children then th that we define as a low-cost mm -hmm. private school. So it c is affordable anyway. Yeah. Uh, the typical schools we're talking about are affordable for a family spending 10% of their income, yeah. Yeah. their total income or their total expenditure. It's the same if you're poor. Yeah, it's a good method. Um, yeah, and, and then we, you can go up to 20% if, if you're bringing in other costs of schooling. Yeah. Yeah. So... In reading this, I was thinking about the parental involvement question, which we get a lot in education generally. How do you increase parental involvement? And my answer is always school choice, school choice, school choice. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to see some of those themes. It wasn't a you know one-to-one -one correlation, but one of the, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, but one of the private school leaders, Sajid Sir, I'm close, mm -hmm. uh, said that, uh, I love his quote, there are three corners of the triangle, parents, teachers, and students. And this triangle must not be a saline triangle. It must be an equilateral triangle. So I was thinking about that and then bringing it home to DC, thinking a little bit about Pat Wolf's work on uh, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, the voucher program here, and how he remarks that the voucher program really brought parents from the margins to the centers of their children's academic experience. And so sort of thinking about the experience that you had and, and thinking about the research here, what do you, how do you think parental involvement has been impacted by these sectors growing in some of these poorer areas? Yeah. We've got to be very careful to distinguish between 
parents receiving vouchers That's right. and parents paying from their own income. Right. Right. And particularly as some voucher programs, I, I, I don't know about the one you described, but some voucher programs don't actually give money to or a voucher to the parents that somehow money gets transferred to a school, perhaps you know, some at the end of the year or whatever, just based on the register of how many children are there. So, And, and so psychologically, that will make a difference, won't it? But I, anyway, I, I'm, I'm not dismissing that having a voucher given yeah. to you to take to a school of your choice will empower you. I'm, I, I'm sure that's true. This is, this is even more empowering is that we've got poor parents spending 10, 20% of their income on their children's um, school fees. It inevitably makes parents um, particular and choosy. And I, I, I get so annoyed um, at our critics, and you know I have many critics, if not enemies, um, who, who all the time talk about parents as if they're stupid ignoramuses, which is one of the titles of the chapters of that book, isn't it? The Beautiful Tree. Um, you know, you should try running <laughs> some schools, which I do now. Um, you know, I just, the, the, the very first schools I co-founded in Ghana, you mentioned the Omega schools, you know, I put my own money in. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a poor professor, damn it. You know, I put in my own money to build the first two or three of those schools. Um, and... You, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a white man. I'm visiting from overseas. The first parent meeting, the parents were complaining. You know, why are there only 10 computers? Why, wasn't, why isn't the playground paved properly? Uh, why was Johnny's teachers absent last week? Um, and, of course, this is wonderful. I'm not complaining, actually. But, you know, there really is empowerment. Um, I have, I have a, a, a business partner who says, remember, okay, so think, think in your own terms. If you're spending 10 or 20% of your income on something, that's a luxury good, isn't it? You know, it might be a beautiful dress or a coat or jewelry or stay in a wonderful hotel or something, you know. The, and you expect a lot when you spend 20% of your income. These parents are the same. We must never, it might be low cost to us, but we must never ever think of it as being anything other than a luxury good to these parents, and therefore they want as, as good as they can get, and they're pretty good at demanding it. <laughs> they're pretty good. That's great. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in the teacher workforce that you observed mm -hmm. in the public, the government systems, in some of these places, and the private sector? Yeah, so, so, so this is... It, it, the, the government teachers, the public school teachers, and the private school teachers are typically completely different s sets of people. Um, and that's the first principle. The, se the second point must be very clear is that your fees, the fees in the private schools, are directly correlated with the, the teacher salaries. So if you're going to have low fees, that inevitably means you're going to have low teacher salaries. Um, so. So you typically have different people teaching in the private schools. They're not people who've gone through the, the, the public universities, got their degrees and their teacher training certificates. They're typically people who, who are maybe for, for elementary school, they're high school graduates. They're people who've got their, um, you know, they're, they're perhaps on their way to doing their undergraduate degree. They're people who will only be in the profession two or three years, probably a bit like you and me, you know. We, do it and we move on to something else. Well, they are doing it to move on to something else eventually one day as well. And so they're typically young, male and female, um, typically uh, enthusiastic, but maybe only going to do it for three, three years, something like that. And so put a lot into it, but not typically well-trained or typically well, um, you know, well, well, well experienced. So, so when people are setting up chains of these schools, now there are a few chains emerging, typically up, the first thing we do is say, let's, what, what does a trained teacher have that these unqualified teachers don't have? And we will try and say, okay, well, they, they can't provide lesson plans. They're not very good at assessment. Assessment is very difficult. 
Um, you know, they're not good at creating student um, activities, exercises. So let's do all that centrally. Let's create centralized lesson plans. Let's maybe send them on a, you know, down to a smartphone that teacher carries, and they can then read the lesson plans. They can read the assessments. They can give them out from the central source. So in that way, you've got these, you know, typically untrained teachers, and you raise their standards, and it, it does work. Nice. So uh, you make this, you go to Hy Hyderabad, you make this phenomenal discovery, uh, start documenting it, do your research for two years or so, and you think to yourself, the international development community is going to be over the moon about it when I bring these findings back, and yet, mm. They were not over the moon. So, I mean, as you come back as this emissary from, you know, these, these faraway places with this great story, why do you think the reception was chilly? Yeah. I, and, and I can't exactly remember at what point I realized people weren't going to be enamored. I think fairly, fairly early on. But we're all enamored. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. But um, no, I, I think we've touched on this already, haven't we? It just goes against everything that the international community believes about the poor. You know, um, if you're pro-poor, you don't want the poor to be doing something completely different from what you said they should be doing, do you? You know, um, and what everyone says should happen. That, that, that you know, there's ideology in the negative sense of the world, not being able to look at. Um, what's really happening, what's really positive, not being able to go with the grain of what poorer parents are choosing. Um, you know, so, so that, and that's disturbing. I, I, you know, I often try and challenge myself, you know, once now, I've been in this area 15, 20 years, you know, supposing, you know, people started, I don't think they will, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm open to whatever evidence comes our, our way. But you can see, you could become quite, rigid in your understanding you know this is my life's work damn it you know i don't want someone coming along and saying it's completely wrong do i and so from the other side you know you so you can sympathize i think with a position that you know it is it is hard realizing that the poor are not behaving in the way that you said they should and you, in theory <laughs> you know you've proved in theory this is the way they should behave you know and in practice they damn well they behave somewhere differently yeah so what have the outcomes been like uh, you're contrasting that with maybe the, the government-run system in a lot of these places. How are the outcomes for the students who are attending these private schools? Yeah. So, so, so all the research that I reviewed um, for the beautiful tree, and now quite a, I mean, not an insignificant corpus of research now, shows typically that the outcomes for students in the private schools are better than the outcomes for the students in the in the in the public schools after controlling for all the relevant factors. Now, there's not a great deal of research on that. I've done some myself, others have done some. But there was a, a gold standard piece of work um, held up as a, the gold standard. It was a randomized controlled trial from Andhra Pradesh, the Andhra Pradesh uh, voucher trial. Um, Kartik Murali Durham from San Diego University conducted the the, the, the study. Now, the initial headline figure that he came out with was actually the the, no difference between the public and the private schools in terms of achievement, the children with the vouchers, but the private schools did it all for a third of the cost, which a lot of, you know, voucher proponents got excited about and said, well, at least, look, at least private schools are incredibly more efficient. It didn't ring true to me. I, I felt uncomfortable with that because, you know, I've seen some of these rural government schools and not been impressed by the level of activity. So I was surprised. Anyway, delving into... I, I happened to know one of the researchers who'd been on the, in the field, and I, I'd, I'd asked him to... I, I wanted to see the test they'd used, and it turned out the tests were different for the private schools and the government schools. Um, the tests were in English for the private schools, even though only half of the private schools were English medium. They were in Telugu, the local language, for the government schools. Once you compared like with like, and I've, I've published this in the Oxford Review of, Review of Education, once you compare like with like, then it's clear, absolutely clear, that, that the private schools significantly outperform the government schools, as well as being for a third of the cost. When I say like for like, if you look at the, 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 the Telugu te test results, the, the, if you look at only the, the children who, who, who were in Telugu medium schools, um, so, yeah, so, so the research, I think, is pretty strong. And, of course, if mathematics and English or literacy and numeracy are important for 
your futures. And it's likely, although no longer children's studies have been done, but it's likely that people, kids will do better in life once they've been to private school than a government school. Yeah. Do you attribute that to competitive effects, to increased parental involvement, curricula, teaching? All, all, all of these things, yeah. all of the above, yeah. I mean, accountability, yeah. competition. Um, curriculum, less mm -hmm. so. I mean, at, at lower levels of schooling, you can supplement what you're doing. Um, but typically, schools have to follow the national curriculum and the national testing. It's the only show in town. It's one of the sort of disadvantages mm -hmm. with the private schools. Um, that they do have to follow this curriculum, and so they haven't got a lot of room for maneuver there. Some, some room for maneuver. Mm. So, last question, and then I'd love to open it up to any questions that that the audience has. But mm. it, it also seemed that uh, maybe not in every country you visited, but the principals of the public schools uh, they tended to uh, believe, I think, or at least argue that parents were leaving their schools to go to the private schools because these poor parents didn't value education, and that's why they were leaving. I mean, that, that just struck me. I, I wasn't entirely surprised, mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously, that that's what the, the uh, government school principals would say, but, you know, that they, they really just, you know, feigned ignorance or said, well, they're leaving because they're, they're not educating their kids, they're just leaving their schools altogether. Yeah. I mean, have, has the attitude among... I guess the, the government system in a lot of these places changed at all? Is there more receptivity to the yes, private sector? D definitely. So, so a lot has changed in the, in the years since, since the book now. And so this, the denial is not there now. People accept that they are, these low-cost private schools are there. This is, and now a, a lot of the international aid agencies are in favor of them. But uh, some, you know, th this means some strange things happen, like the British aid agency then gave a huge gave a huge sum of money to one um, in, uh, uh, one chain of low-cost private schools to start up afresh somewhere else. And, you know, that distorts the market. So they, you know, they didn't quite work out how to go with the grain in the market. Um, in Liberia, there's something very interesting happening now where there's this program called Partnership Schools for Liberia, where, where private companies are invited in to take over the failing public schools. You know, it's it's an interesting project. Um, I I've not been particularly in favour of it. I would much rather if you're going to do that sort of thing. Well, let's give the kids vouchers so they can choose existing private schools or existing private schools can come into the market. Um, but anyway, there there is development now, and and uh, so that that in a sense that bleak picture that beautiful tree ended with, where everyone was in denial, yeah. that has changed. Now people know that they are there. There's still a long way to go before people celebrate their existence. Um, but yeah. Great. Well, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll have a mic that will come around. Uh, but look, if anybody thinks we don't have diverse panels, I mean, you're probably one of the few, you know, uh, former socialist folks that we've had on a heritage panel. So <laughs> great to. Yes, Mr. Evers. Um, I wondered if. Fascinating presentation. Um, I wonder if you could go a little farther into the pathways and some of these other things, because it's been both in East Africa and in Liberia, and there have been union. I mean, I read the Financial Times, and it's just hysteria on the part of the unions and government officials, and yet some politicians really defend them and have kind of, I mean, granted, it's not parents' own money in the game, which is part of what concerns you, I know. But anyway, I just thought maybe you could elaborate a little further on this. Yeah. So, so you, you were probably talking about a particular education company in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda. Right. And then they, they led on the Liberia model. That, right. That, that, that Bridge International. Um, I've got a great deal of respect for Bridge. In East Africa and, and elsewhere, they are doing this purely private model where parents are spending their own money. But, but in, the labor unions have still been trying to pressure them to be clear. Yes, and, and let's, how can I put this delicately? Um, you, you know, there are ways of going about working in, in countries in Africa and, and elsewhere, which, you know, you, you've, however much you might disagree with government policy, you know, you've got to try and get government on your side. And 
So the question is raised, really, whether you know, some groups have perhaps offended government more than they needed to. Um, and, and that's led to some of these problems, maybe. But I think the, the, the main reason, in my view, why the labor unions, the teacher unions, the international teacher unions, Education International, are so up in arms about um, low-cost private school providers is because of the Liberia experiment. Because there you have got public schools being handed over to the private sector. The contracting out. Yes, yeah, the contracting out. So the purely private, I mean, in a way, you can't do anything about that. You know, Omega schools in Ghana. The, remember, in Nigeria, there are fourteen thousand of these low-cost private schools in in Lagos State alone. You you know you you can't really, as a as a union, you can't do anything about it because these are purely private ventures that parents are freely choosing. You know, you can't say, and there's no union teachers in the schools. So it's really when you get the only when you get public money coming in that I think the the real problem emerges. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? So I uh, did want to ask just quickly, the percentage of kids generally who are in the private ed sector yeah. so, you know, varies country to country. Yeah, but. but there are some places where really good studies have been done, and typically in urban West Africa and urban South Asia, those were the best studies have been done, it's about 70% of the kids are in private schools. It's an amazing figure. You know, we, people assume this is, and I should have said this earlier on, people assume it's quite a small scale thing, but urban areas typically around 70%. In rural areas, the, the only really properly studied areas are South Asia, India and Pakistan. There's a, something called the ASA, the Annual Status of Education Report, and that's on about 30% now in India. So think 70% in urban India, 30% in rural India, and I think it's somewhat similar in Pakistan. Um, so these are, these are hu this is a huge phenomenon. It's, it's fascinating to, to put it in context, right? We still have 90% of students in the US who are attending public schools. Uh, yes. so, I mean, yeah. it, it's a yeah. huge movement, and the fact that you've got 30% in rural areas, this is something yeah. that we're pushing back. I think the school choice community, this idea that how could private education possibly work in rural areas, and yeah. it's a really good. I mean, rural India is perhaps more crowded than rural America, oh, but nonetheless. You know, <laughs> uh, let me go back to here. the middle. Yeah. Hello, I am Hyman Arbonne, and I am with the National Economist Club in Washington, D.C. And um, just a few comments and also a, a question. Um, when I was reading this book, I have several family members who are educators here in the United States. Mm. And I, I found the book uh, not only enjoyable to read, but with very profound lessons uh, for change. And um, some of the comments I got back from my family members and other friends who are educators is that, oh, well, but, you know, that's fine, but uh, that applies to countries that are uh, poorer than the United States. You know, how can we apply the lessons from the beautiful tree to mm. our current education system here in the U.S.? Yeah. And uh, if I may, um, the other question is about uh, the notion about parents knowing best what is the education for their children. Mm. And... A complaint that I have received also from educators is that sometimes parents hinder the education and the development of, mm. of students by not allowing uh, teachers to develop uh, relationship with students or, or yeah. things like that. Uh, so sometimes teachers have to act as parents. Yeah. Besides being teachers, so yeah. Just and, and and just uh, so two questions. So prompt me if I'd forget the second one. But the the, the first one, um, which, I, which I've forgotten. Um, so the first one again. Remind me with applying and, the lessons. Oh yeah, applying the lessons. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm very jet lagged. So this is um, you my, got in it. Like two a.m. from Mexico. City. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the the um, applying the lessons. So in the beautiful tree, I do do something uh, as 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 was said in the introduction. You know that it, it really. Does the evidence does challenge the objections to Milton Friedman's arguments? Doesn't it? it does show that the poor are willing to pay, the poor are willing to exercise choice, that the supply side will exist. If, there are, if there's demand from parents, then you will get 
schools emerging. You know, so these are very important lessons because they were, you know, the critics of Milton Friedman when he was writing his argument, first of all, back in the 60s, no, 50s and 60s, was that you couldn't possibly have anything like a market in education. This absolutely puts that argument to bed. It's, it's wrong. It doesn't. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is, for me, and very topical, um, that, you know, I, I've given talks about this book and this research quite a lot. And often in America and England, Australia, New Zealand, someone will say, could this something similar happen here? And, you know, I've always had to think, well, I don't really know. I mean, the government schools, we all will complain about the public schools in America and Britain, but they're not as bad as those ones you see in Nigeria or India. Let's be fair. Um, you know, and also there's a welfare state in these places, so people perhaps might not, you know, want, in, our, in our countries, so people might not feel like paying the, some money for their education. But I actually, I couldn't travel for a bit, and, and a, a year or two ago for various reasons, and I, I did some research in Newcastle, where I live in the north of England, and, and f just asked people, would they be prepared to pay, uh, ordinary people, North uh, Newcastle is one of the sort of poorer parts of England, it's got some of the poorest parts of England, would they be prepared to pay for education? And um, and I found quite a few of them would, to my surprise. And, and then I did a business model and found perhaps I could, I could do schooling for about fifty-two pounds a week, um, which is about two thousand seven hundred pounds a year, which is half the cost of what the state gives for education, and about you know a fifth or a quarter of the cost of the average private school. And um, got together with some colleagues and we are going to start a low-cost private school in the northeast of England if we can get government permission. Um, we, we've, we've been trying for a while and we haven't yet got it. Um, I just mentioned this. No, it was my, my business partner mentioned it in passing to the, Sun, the Durham Advertiser. You know, it's one of these freed weekly papers that gets shoved in people's doors. And, it, and they put it on their front page. And immediately, the national press picked this up, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail, the Times, um, I understand, that, um, and, and the BBC and others. And suddenly, people who would otherwise you know, supposedly be, be against this would approach me you know, with left-wing professors and say, do you know, if this had been available when I had ki my kids were of school age, I would have used it. You know? because the state schools were not really good enough. And a lot of people can't afford private education. You know, I couldn't afford private education for my kids if I was a, you know. So, so, so watch this space, you know, we are gonna do it. Now that was a long answer, and there was a second part of the question, which of course I've forgotten. Do parents but, really know best? Yeah, well, do parents really know best? No, they don't, do they? Um, but, d d but better than anyone else. I think that's the thing, isn't it? And, you know, some will make mistakes. I mean, a lot of the objections from, par are from parents I know to teachers is when teachers are doing some sort of fads, you know, educational fads which come and go and, and stop us learning <laughs> properly, you know. Thank God I know seven-eighths of 56, because I learned that by rote, but I, I wish I knew some languages and some Shakespearean sonnets as well. That sort of thing we didn't do by rote when I was a kid. Um, so do you see what I'm saying? Obviously, no one knows best but some know better than others, and it's probably on balance, parents know better than anyone else. Great, so uh, we'll go in the back one more time, then back to, to Mr. Evers. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to um, like who is starting these schools? You mentioned that there are some organizations that are looking to provide the lesson plans and provide, you know, or is it like people from the community and now other yeah. people are coming in and starting chains of schools? So just yeah. a little bit more about so who's providing this. So school. just be very careful to distinguish that. There's the chains of schools are a recent phenomenon. They're post the beautiful tree in effect, um, or post that sort of research. Um, and they are typically, not always, but typically done by outsiders. Um, working with the model. So, and they are very tiny compared to the existing phenomenon. You know, however big they've grown to be, they're tiny compared to the hundreds of thousands of these private schools already. So put them to one side. Um, for the existing low-cost private schools, you know, there, there, there are sort of three types of models that I would say. One would typically be a, 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 a mother who starts a kindergarten for her kids and a few other families in the street. And then when the kids get to grade, you know, uh, grade one age, 
Um, the parents say, you know, surely grade, grade one is not that different from kindergarten. Why can't they stay with you? And, and so a school is grown from the sort of bottom up. Another model is typically someone might start what um, tuition class, you know, um, a crammer for the exams. And um, the kids say, well, we, you know, the older kids, we learn much more from you than we do in school. Why don't we just stay with you all the time? And a school is grown from the sort of top down. But quite a lot now, there are people opening schools because they see it's a, it seems to be a viable business to take part in now. There are a lot of people coming into it for that reason um, and operating schools often very successfully. So now, and they could be any sort of person, you know, male, female, couple, um, uh, you know, of, of, any, of any sort of background. Um, so the, but the chains are different. We'll wrap up with one more. I thought people here would be interested. We're learning a little more in America mm -hmm. about teacher absenteeism. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of the American public doesn't really realize how serious it is in America. Mm. But in South Asia and in Africa, I believe that you have pretty well dug into the fact that people get appointments as teachers as kind of a political plum or kind of a sinecure, like you used to have uh, Anglican priests in England who would get the living, but they were never there. <laughs> so yeah. it was a somewhat a thing similar to this. And I wonder if you could expand on this and yeah. explain it to this audience. Uh, so, it's so, very interesting. Yeah, so teacher absenteeism is you know, the major problem in the public schools in, you know, in the countries we've been talking about, and, and, and more generally. You know. um, but the, 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 the report that got us got me excited about this way back, you know, when I first started doing this research, was the probe report. And it found, I, I forget the exact figure, but I think it was only in, around 50% of the classes were, were the teachers teaching. You know, they were absent a quarter of the time, they were in school but not teaching another quarter of the time. They were only teaching about 50% of the time. And study after study has found, you know, something somewhat similar to that, that figure um, it, across, across countries in the public schools. In the private schools, it's obviously a lot lower because if you're absent in the private schools for too long, you'll get fired, you know, it's pretty simple. Um, so you tend not to be absent. In the government schools, you won't get fired. You know, you, you'll, um, it, it is a sinecure, as you say, it's a job for life, um, you get a good pension. I, I remember talking to some government uh, um, officials in the state of Karnataka in India and they were saying, um, you know, uh, we, you know, we, we can't get rid of teachers. Only God can get rid of public school teachers. And then they hesitated from him and said, no, not even God. You know, it really is a serious issue. Some studies have found, for example, if you're going to... Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But you go into some areas and you'll see uh, young in inexperienced teachers in the public schools who are somewhat similar to the young inexperienced teachers in the private schools. And you'll find that the relatively well-paid public school teacher has hired a very relatively unwell-paid, uh, low-paid uh, person to take on his or her job. And so, they, so, so they're, in a sense, being quite responsible, aren't they? They're not leaving the classroom vacant. They're actually leave, putting someone in there to do their job um, paying them a quarter or a fifth of what they get and, and then going to do what they, they want to do, yeah. So, so the, the, these are anecdotes, but, you know, the research is fairly clear. But you think of that figure of 50% of people teaching. And, and also, yeah, I mean, the, you know, there are, of course, some good government school teachers in these places, but you'd soon get, you know, imagine, you know, if, you know, we were going into that sort of place, young, keen, uh, I'm not saying I'm young now, but when I was young, you know, young, keen teacher, you'd soon get sucked into that, wouldn't you? If you, if you were supposed to be in a school with 10 teachers, only a couple of teachers present, and the rest are doing something else or lazing around, getting the kids to do chores, you'd soon, you'd have to be pretty strong to resist that peer pressure. So you can just see how the system is bust. Yeah. But the good news is 70% of the kids are escaping it. And... Uh, and as you read from my book, you know, the more this happens, I mean, people are predicting in Lagos State that there'll be 90% before too long. You know, this is a growing phenomenon. There are kids coming into the state, being born or migrating into the state, and they're 
private schools are the only place they, they go to. That's the only schools that are ex those are the only schools that are expanding. So there's great hope. <laughs> there's great hope. And I think, going back to the question about America, you know, the examples that are from the rest of the world can surely inspire, I think, the school choice movement here, even if the lessons aren't directly relevant. I think there's great inspiration. That's great. Well, that's a great note to end on. Before thanking Dr. Tooley, uh, just a note that we're going to show episode three. That sounds like a Star Wars thing. Uh, episode three of School, Inc. Uh, Dr. Neil McCluskey is going to help us with that, uh, which we're very excited to show and which you're featured in as well, oh. which is great. So, But please, uh, if you'd like to stick around, it'll be a fascinating, fascinating uh, video to watch. It's about 50 minutes or so uh, long. But before that, please join me in thanking Dr. James Tooley. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay there. Uh, we'll both move. And while they're getting the video queued up, uh, I'll just give a quick little introduction of Neil McCluskey, who is the director of the Cato Institute Center for Educational Freedom. Prior to arriving at Cato, Dr. McCluskey served in the US Army, taught high school English, so he can actually translate British English to American English, which would have been useful. Uh, <laughs> taught high school English and was a freelance reporter. He holds an undergraduate degree from Georgetown and a master's degree from Rutgers and a PhD in public policy from George Mason University. So we're gonna show the clip and then Neil has graciously uh, said that he'd stick around, answer any questions, uh, that you might have, but it's a great compliment to Dr. Tooley's book. So thanks for everybody who stuck around. I, I just wanted to uh, have Neil here in case anybody had questions about the film, about how they came to make it, about how PBS aired it, and uh, whether or not it's going to hold up against backpack full of cash. Is that what uh, Matt Damon's? Uh, it's Matt, it's Matt Damon's uh, big project is backpack full of cash. All his other movies pale in comparison. I hear. <laughs> I don't know if any of y'all have heard of this film that's coming out, Backpack Full of Cash. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it sounds like it's going to be interesting. I haven't seen anything about it yet. But any questions for Neil, uh, the video, any questions for uh, what you saw earlier? Can I just preface this all by saying this whole production almost was entirely Andrew Coulson's yeah. work. I mean, he had some videographers and people like that, but he did almost all of it himself. Um, and so, one, that means I, I don't get any credit for it, which is fine, because I didn't really do a whole lot for it. And that's a huge testament to what he did when he took on this project. So that's something I think everybody should know uh, beforehand. He didn't have Matt Damon in there, you know, doing all the heavy lifting for him. Yeah. Very good. Um, any yeah, questions? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, let me, I'll just give you a brief, what we've seen happen to this video, or to this um, documentary, and then this backpack full of catch, it's, it turns out a big part of this story. So, uh, Andrew's goal all along was to get PBS to show his documentary, which it turns out is not an easy process. Um, and again, I wasn't intimately involved in any of the machinations to get this done, but it's, it's PBS isn't someone you just go to and you say, hey, I got something you might want to show on your network, and they're like, sure, yeah, sure, when, when, when would you like us to do it? Um, and so there's a lot of work to get it shown, but eventually he succeeded, and I think part of the reason he succeeded is it's actually a very high quality product, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, now I'm a little biased, but I actually think it's a pretty entertaining professional uh, documentary, and it, to PBS's credit, it presents an opinion you don't usually see on PBS, um, which is the, even just talking about the idea that maybe profit could be something beneficial in education. And because he did it in an entertaining sort of educational way, uh, I think they said this is something that we want to show. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, there are some people who do not like the idea of profit or even private education uh, who took exception to this. Uh, first and foremost is Diane Ravitch, who you People who do education policy may know Diane Ravitch. She's a well-known education historian. Um, at one time, she was, I, I don't want to characterize her unfairly, but I think she was sort of a, 
uh, a weak supporter of school choice. It was never something that I think she was adamant about, but she recognized uh, at least some need for people in public schools that didn't serve them well to have an option. She eventually uh, came to believe that school choice was unacceptable. Um, lots of other things in education she didn't like, and she's become a very stalwart defender of the system as it is. Although I do think she would like more local control, a little less federal control, but generally speaking, she likes the idea of public schools. And she got, when word got out that PBS was going to show this documentary, she said, this is unacceptable. And she has uh, a group, the National, what is it, Public Education Center, I can't even remember, it's NPEC, NEPC, whatever it is. Um, but they are also stalwart defenders of public schooling, and they said, this is unacceptable. And they actually started a letter writing campaign. You, they may still have their website up and their web page where they had a form letter that they, they encouraged all their members to say, tell PBS not to show this documentary. And if your local station wants to show it, tell them to remove it. Now, I don't have a lot, you know, I have a lot of time on my hands, so I monitor this sort of thing. And I said, wow, it's sort of extraordinary that you are calling for the removal of this documentary if it's slated to be shown. They eventually got rid of that call to remove it, but said actually from the beginning, but then emphasized even more, if PBS stations, you choose to show this Andrew Coulson uh, documentary, you should also show Backpack Full of Cash, which is a documentary that, as I understand it, I haven't seen it, but that attacks the idea that there should be charter schools, uh, school cho private school choice programs, and the idea that there's some sort of, they call it corporate reform, um, that, that goes against all those sorts of reforms. But in particular, they hate this idea of privatization. And it just so happens that that documentary has, just in the last few days, actually, gotten a big crease uh, uh, in attention because Matt Damon is the narrator. And if you know Matt Damon, you know his mom is a very influential, well-known sort of progressive educator, a defender of the public schooling system. And so he's often lent his name and his voice and his celebrity to kind of pro-public school uh, um, events and, and, and uh, I think other programming, but I think this documentary is the first one he's actually narrated. And it became a big issue, one, because he kind of famously sends his own kids to private schools. And at a screening in Boston, which I believe also happened at a private school, um, uh, they, they had a big screening of this backpack full of cash. And some people said, well, this is sort of hypocritical. He sends his own kids to private school. They're, they're screening this thing at a private school. And then I just saw today Jeannie Allen, who runs the Center for Education Reform, um, she apparently is interviewed in Backpack Full of Cash. Um, apparently, at least from what I've read, she thinks she was sort of interviewed under false pretenses and definitely says she was taken out of context. And all this is now connected to Matt Damon because he is the big name and the big face associated with this thing. But it has also been kind of the counterpoint to School Inc. that Diane Ravitch and others want to see promoted and put on PBS. Not the recent ones. Um, I certainly wrote articles, and some other people wrote articles about School Inc. saying, why uh, do public schooling defenders want to shut it down? And at the very least say, well, you've at least got to balance it out with this backpack full of cash. Interestingly, the National Education Association in their national convent conference convention a couple months ago actually passed an official condemnation of School Inc. Uh, because it would dare to suggest that maybe the private sector can handle education. So there's been some movement around this, um, but I think that, that the opponents have realized they were actually helping to promote the film by talking about it. So now I think they're putting most of their efforts into saying, PBS, show this backpack full of cash. Amazing. Any other questions from the audience? It's really a phenomenal movie. And I uh, said when I introduced Dr. Tooley that The Beautiful Tree was one of the first books I ever read uh, when I came to Heritage. But Market Education was the first book I ever read, which was Andrew Colson's, uh, is Andrew Colson's book. So it was, it was a really good book. I'm going to do a, a shameless promo. Oh, I got everything. I bring lots of stuff. So there's Beautiful Tree, but I saw that was for sale outside. 
You can get DVDs of School Inc. It was, so Andrew, I should say, did almost all the work on this. But uh, as you see, Andrew uh, sadly passed away a couple of years ago. In fact, as, as you watch this last episode, you've seen some scenes where he's wearing a cap. That's because Andrew got brain cancer. And he was wearing that cap after he had operations and through chemotherapy, and they needed him to fill in some spots. And so he actually kind of looks, he looks like he aged a lot. And that's because he was actually fighting brain cancer at the time that the finishing touches were being put on this. And important to note, Free to Choose Media, which is, you may know Free to Choose Media because they got kind of their start with Free to Choose on PBS, Milton Friedman. They sort of took this under their wing right at the end and really put the finishing touches on it. They did some of the work with PBS and they certainly deserve all sorts of credit also for, for School Inc. And so you can get DVDs from them, you can watch it online, and then one last shameless promotion. Um, we're, we don't get any money out of this, though, so it works out. Um, we do have to pay because we're all about profit, right? That's true. Private, yeah. Well, no, we're about civil society, too, and if other people want to pay and then you get stuff for free, that's fine. Um, but we did this book, Educational Freedom, Remembering Andrew Coulson Debating His Ideas. Because Andrew was no longer with us, we thought there'd be a lot of people who saw School, Inc., who'd want to know more about Andrew and more about the sort of issues that are talked about in the in the. Uh, documentary, as well as other things that he talked about. And so we made this book so that anybody interested could go right to the Cato website and download it. You can get this in PDF form totally for free if you want. It's on our website. Uh, but you can also get it Amazon, uh, uh, print on demand, or ebooks, or things like that. So if you want to learn more about Andrew as a person, but in particular delve into some of the debates that are on the documentary or that school choice people have, we Tax, talk, credit versus vouchers. <laughs> tax credits and vouchers were on there, clearly. Um, we have three chapters debating tax credits and vouchers. So if you're really into that, then certainly get this book. Great. Thank you. Any final questions for Neil? All right. Well, oh, oh. perfect. We'll take Yeah, the problem I think that we've seen for a very long time is it's just not easy to just fix the public schools. And the big part of that is because politically, the people who have the most influence over what happens in the public schools are those people who would be subject to the reforms. And it's not because they're bad people, that they're any better or worse than anyone else, but if you were an, a teacher, you were especially a teacher's union, you'd say, look, or just look, I'll take myself as an example. So it would be much easier for me if nobody at Cato ever said that I had to produce anything, they didn't care what my, you know, what my output was, and also they paid me whatever I wanted. The, ideally, that's what I'd want. Ideally, that is what people in, 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 in school administration, teachers, that's ideally, I think, what they want. Doesn't mean they don't want to do a good job, but their natural incentives are not to be held accountable by people on the outside if they could be. When you have government control of the schools, that means politics controls the schools, and the people who have the most at stake in a policy area will tend to be the ones who are most engaged in that policy area. And that means those people, the teachers' unions, the administrators' associations, who would have that accountability imposed on them, tend to be the ones most involved, strongly involved in education politics, and they fight those sorts of things. So there are lots of other reasons it's hard to, to change public schools, but that is a fundamental reason that it's so hard to do things in public schools that we think ought to be easy. Just say, teach better, uh, let's all learn more, and it would be, isn't that the way we should go? And that's what often teachers unions like to say is, we don't need school choice, we just need everybody to have a great public school. And what we've seen repeatedly is that you just can't go and say, let's make this a great public school, and then it will become one. Thanks for the
question. Great. Any other questions for Neil? Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Neil, for sticking around. Sure. Thank you for all this. I really appreciate it.